Well, good morning and a very warm welcome to our second instalment of the 43rd Annual Moore College Lectures that are being delivered in virtual mode this year by the Reverend Dr. David Pony. If you tuned in last Thursday night, David began this series with a penetrating diagnosis of the crisis in modern identity. The modern self may be described as a choosing self, David suggested, heavily shaped by romanticism, the rise of capitalism, and those Paul Ricoeur dubbed the masters of suspicion. Towards the end of the lecture, we were given a tantalizing introduction to the theme that will occupy much of David's attention in the lectures that he will give this week, the prospect of finding liberation from this crisis in identity through being swept up in the Father's choice of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we very much look forward to the first of those this morning. Hopefully you've been able to download a full outline for the lecture, uh, which is available online via the link that you were sent in the uh, live stream links. David, once again, has kindly consented to answer questions after the lecture. And if you'd like to ask David, a question today, we're using the Slido app or the Slido website. Um, the information is available via the web link that you were sent in an email from the college. If you have the Slido app, please use today's six digit code um, that's available on the web page containing the live stream links. Um, or if you'd just like to ask a question via the Slido website, you can just click on the red box, ask questions via Slido, which is located just under the live stream window for each day. So just post your question and we should be able to get through quite a number of them in the time that's available. Um, you'll also be able to uh, indicate questions that you would like most answered. You might like to know that the live stream uh, link for these lectures will be active for a week to watch again or catch up on another day. Um, the lectures will then uh, be made available via the Moore College lecture, lecture uh, website in a couple of weeks time free of charge. And before David comes up to deliver the second of his lectures, I'm going to read from Colossians chapter one, verses 15 to 23. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. I now have the great pleasure of uh, introducing our speaker, the Reverend Dr. David Honey. David has been on the faculty of Moore College since 2007, where since 2018 he has served as our academic dean. Prior to this, he completed a PhD at the University of Cambridge, studying under Professor David Fergus Ford, uh, which uh, was published in 2009 as The Spirit and Sonship 
developing Colin Gunton's theology of particularity. David has served on the staff of Anglican churches in Sydney and Canberra, and his most recent publication came in 2019, a volume on eschatology appropriately entitled The Last Things. David is married to Amelia and they have three adult children. And before David comes up, let me lead us in prayer. Our loving Father, we thank you so much for our brother, David, uh, for the servant that you have made him to be and for the great gifts that you have given him. We thank you, Father, for the work that he has put into preparing these lectures, uh, for the way that you have nourished his understanding, uh, particularly, Father, of uh, the way in which you have revealed yourself to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you would go before us all today and particularly um, be with David as he presents and that this would be a richly edifying experience for us all and we would all grow in our knowledge and love of the Lord Jesus and uh, be um, uh, equipped better to be those who will uh, honour him uh, in lives of love and good deeds. So we commit our time to you. We particularly commit David to you now in Jesus' name. Well, amen. Wherever you are, I'm sure that you'll uh, join with me in extending a virtual welcome to Dr. Honey to give, a, give his lecture now. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you again. Last Thursday, I began the lectures with the conclusion of Vaclav Havel about the state of modern identity in crisis. Let me just remind you what Havel wrote. I believe that with the loss of God, humans lost a kind of absolute and universal system of coordinates to which they could always relate everything chiefly themselves. Their world and their personality gradually began to break up into separate, incoherent fragments corresponding to different relative coordinates. In response to Havel, I propose that it is as the choosing self that contemporary men and women strive and strain to establish the necessary means to hold all things together. In addition, I suggested that we could capture something of the way that the choosing self struggles with fragmentation and incoherence by thinking of the modern identity as involving a spectrum disorder or a syndrome. I then identified three mutually constitutive clusters of symptoms along that spectrum that is the choosing self. The clusters were romanticism, capitalism and suspicion. The God displaced by the culture of modernity still speaks in the power of his spirit, still acts through the person of his word, still saves from his love for the world as the extraordinary results of mission in the two-thirds world during the 20th century can confirm. In the New Testament, we're told that it is in God's choice of Jesus as Lord and Messiah that all things in heaven and on earth hold together. And so throughout these lectures, I will seek an answer to the following question. What happens when God's choice of Jesus confronts the choosing self? What happens when God's choice of Jesus confronts the choosing self? Now, those of you who were able to tune in with us last Thursday night will recall that I quoted Bonhoeffer to summarise the gospel claim in God's choice of Jesus as Lord and Messiah in the following way. Let me remind you of that too. In Christ, the offer meets us to receive a share in the reality of God and the reality of the world together, not one without the other. The reality of God opens itself in the same way that it puts me completely in the reality of the world. However, I find the reality of the world always already born, adopted and reconciled in the reality of God. Throughout this week, and especially this morning, we'll begin rereading the scriptures to substantiate and expand upon Bonhoeffer's assertion concerning God, the world, and reality. But we will do so mindful of the alternative theological claims or assumptions of the choosing self, 
and its relationship both to God and the world. (coughs) Speaking of which, there's one particular sign of the choosing self which might have led you to question Harvel's conclusion about the loss of God for the modern identity. That was the way the romantics spoke of the living force of things and the innate connection between the artist's soul and the world as realised through her art. You'll recall that it was through appealing to Spinoza, the Jewish pantheist, that romantics developed a spiritual link between themselves as individuals and the rest of the universe. The pantheistic element of romantic thought was, as I indicated, a source of discontent even amongst themselves, as some argued for a thoroughly materialistic definition of anything that could be considered spiritual like the way that Richard Dawkins tries to wax lyrical about the wonders of the natural world, even its glory, all the while admitting that our lives are governed by nothing but pitiless indifference. As we saw, Nietzsche was certainly suspicious of the romantics for this characteristic. Others, however, like Friedrich Schleiermacher, simply romanticised Protestant Calvinist theology, leaving it with a distinctively pantheistic odour. Alternatively, the Lutheran philosopher George W.F. Hegel developed an an encyclopedic worldview that relates the struggles of the mind, the machinations of the state, the history of the world, and the life of God himself. Now, there's a quote on your outline from Hegel. Let me read it to you. This unity of being, (coughs) excuse me, this unity of being and thinking, God is therefore here revealed as he is. He is there in the way that he is in itself. He is there as spirit. When the individual struggles to reach a synthesis of life's experiences between progress and its negatives, he is reliving the history of the world even as he is participating in the life of God. Now, I mention Hegel's philosophy for three reasons. Firstly, Because if you were tuned in with us last Thursday, you will have heard me use the phrase, the Lord Jesus is God's choice for himself or God's self-determination in Christ and by the Spirit. I use this kind of language in relation to the way the gospel shapes the choosing self's understanding of itself in relation to the history of Jesus the Christ. This was the charge I put to the choosing self. Where do you figure in the history of Jesus? Secondly, when Paul tells tells us that the Father created all things through his image and firstborn and for him, how significant is the history of the world in terms of God's self-determination? If God's being is known only through his acts, his word and his deed, or the economy of salvation, what kind of share in the reality of God does the history of the world provide us with? And thirdly, Hegel also said, the life of God and divine cognition might be expressed as a game love plays with itself. If this idea lacks the seriousness, the suffering, the patience and the labour of the negative, then it lowers itself into triteness. In such a life, there is neither anything serious in this otherness and alienation, nor in overcoming this alienation. In short, and with quite some paraphrasing, Hegel is saying here, any concept of God in himself that doesn't include the experience of suffering in the world and its overcoming isn't Christian theology. For Hegel, in the cross and resurrection of Jesus, God's life in relation to creation is one with the history of the world in all its progress and setbacks so that the resolution for history is a divine self-actualization. Now, if I argue, as I will, that the theological history of the world that confronts the choosing self is the means by which the Father chooses to reveal in the Spirit his eternal love for his Son and vice versa, is that a bit too romantic for an account of the life of God in relation to the creation of the world? Patristic scholars like Lewis Ayres say yes, more or less. Ayres, for his part, is suspicious of Hegelianism in modern Trinitarian theology, especially the voices that have been raised against Augustine. 
He denounces any form of modern personalism that seeks to inject a supposed dynamism in the divine life. Ayers complains that many 19th and 20th century theologians who claim to be reviving the doctrine of the Trinity, like Hegel before them, introduced a transformation, misunderstanding or outright rejection of the ways in which classical Trinitarian tradition describes divine activity and movement. That's a quote from Ayers himself. <clears throat> As we shall see, when it comes to Hegel at least, Ayers' concerns have some merit. However, rather than mounting a defence of modern Trinitarian theology per se, I'll simply heed the warning not to forget to consult the architects of Nicene theology as we reread the scriptures. For that matter, though, when it comes to Ayer's version of pro-Nicene theology, as John Bears had counted, while the East-West division has been overplayed for much of the 20th century, Ayer's account tends towards the opposite extreme, as categories more natural to Augustine are applied to the Cappadocian fathers. For example, argues Bear, the 4th century linguistic practice, a term from Ayers, does not include ascribing God to each hypostasis, but only to the Father, and genitively, Son and Spirit. I quote Bear, to speak of the triune or the Trinitarian God, the one, who is, the one God who is three, Father, Son and Spirit, sounds not only odd but distinctly modalist. Now, at the risk of sounding like one of the Corinthians, to keep our Bible reading within the bounds of the councils of Nicaea and Constantinople, I will follow Athanasius. Though only a spectator at Nicaea, he is the theologian who did the heavy lifting against Arius and his various followers for much of the 4th century. As both East and Western scholars have rightly stated, his voice must be foundational to any position that claims to be pro-Nicene. We're exploring the significance of the Father's choice of Jesus as Lord and Messiah, both for himself and for the choosing self. <coughs> Excuse me. On such an expedition, Athanasius makes an ideal conversation partner. As Khaled Anatolius has shown, one essential thing that Arius has in common with those who followed him was that the Father, Son and Spirit were unified in the will of the Father, his choice. Here's a quote from Arius himself. By the will of God, the Son is stably and unalterably what he is, a perfect creature, not just one among others. He is the inheritor of all the gifts and glories of God can give him. But since this is the effect of God's sovereign will, the Father's glory and dignity is in no way lessened by such a gift. Now, that English translation comes from the uh, work of Rowan Williams on Arius. As we shall see, a repeated concern for Athanasius against the various strains of Arian theology was this proposition, that the eternal Son was a product of the Father's will and not the coexistent and coessential mediator of it. So after our first Zoom stretch, which, by the way, is brought to you for, by uh, Usain Bolt, let's return to the scriptures, trusting in the power of the Spirit to grant us a share in the reality of God who confronts the choosing self. So then, deep breath, Zoom stretch. We're seeking an answer to the question of what happens when God's choice of Jesus as Lord and Messiah confronts the choosing self. Since it is in Christ Jesus that all things hold together, in the power of the Spirit, we expect that it is through him that we shall receive a share in the reality of God and the reality of the world together. We shall receive this share by attending to the history of God's acts captured in the scriptures as they are shaped by the gospel. Yet as we do, we'll need to be mindful to make a distinction between the narrative's development of who God is as opposed to what God is. That is, to avoid the choosing self's Hegelian tendencies of equating the life of God with the history of the world. We'll avoid this tendency by attending to the ministry of Athanasius of Alexandria. From the bishop, we hope to gain advice, particularly as we seek to understand the choice of the Father for Jesus as the means by which the Father's will is perfected in the world 
by his spirit. So let's turn together to the Bible, and in particular, the letter to Colossians that Andrew read out for us, chapter 1, 15 to 23. I'm going to use this passage as a launch pad into the rest of the Bible for the sake of holding all these lectures together. More importantly, though, this passage is one of the few concise units with such a wonderful scope for meditating on the acts of the Father through Christ and for the world. In addition, it also contains a number of concepts that were directly pertinent to the Nicene debates. So then, the share of the reality of God and the world, or really, the reality of the God of the world. <coughs> Colossians 1 begins with two essential concepts for understanding the share in, of the reality of God that we receive in the Father's choice of Jesus as Lord and Messiah. In verse 15, Paul describes Jesus as the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. To get a grasp on the theological significance of these terms, we need first to attend to the verses immediately prior to the beginning of this hymn, as some have called the passage. You may notice from verse 13 that Paul is applying the language of image and firstborn to the beloved son, the king of God's kingdom. In the gospel accounts, the term appears invariably in circumstances of God addressing Jesus of Nazareth directly as my beloved son, in whom I delight, invariably in the presence or in the activity of the Spirit. In these events, a nexus of messianic prophecies emerges in the identity of Jesus as the son of David and son of God. Whether it is the 2 Samuel 7 covenant with David, the spirit-empowered sermon of Isaiah from chapter 42, or the various messianic psalms, Psalm 2, Psalm 72, Psalm 110, when Paul refers to the beloved son as the image and firstborn, it seems most likely that we should expect God's embodied image to execute messianic rule over all the kingdoms of the earth as the firstborn, as promised in Psalm 89, verse 27. What is more, such mediated divine activity is at least what we expect of the one exalted to the right hand of God, the king whom David referred to as Lord and foresaw God saying, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. That's Psalm 110 verse 1. With the resurrection of Jesus from the dead in the power of the Spirit, especially with the subsequent outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost, this portrait of the Messiah as the universal and heavenly mediator of divine rule becomes one of the dominant images of Messiah Jesus as Lord. <coughs> Peter, Paul, Hebrews, John, and even the Lord himself make reference to it. The language of image in reference to the ascended Christ appears elsewhere in the New Testament mainly 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, and echoes of the description of the human beings from the Genesis 1 account. I'm thinking of Genesis 1, verse 27. The significant difference between Christ Jesus and Adam is, however, the unqualified sense in which Christ Jesus images the invisible creator to the world. He is the image. In contrast, we read in Genesis 1 that the man and the woman are made in the likeness in the image of God. According to Bill Dumbrell, this modification seems significant as a way of avoiding an exact representation of God by humans, though aspects, of course, of either phrase appear singularly throughout the prehistory chapters. Some of the fathers, like Irenaeus, understood Genesis 1 to be an anticipation of what we read in Colossians 1.15. Since Christ Jesus is definitively the image of God, or later, the one in whom all the fullness of God dwells in bodily form. That's Colossians 2 verse 9 and similarly 119. In addition, Paul refers to Adam as a type of the one to come in reference to the risen Christ in Romans 5.14. So as the image of the invisible God, Christ Jesus does more than remind the world of God as a likeness could. Instead, in Christ the creator God is present and accessible. 
when used of Jesus the Christ in particular, the language of image is the language of presence or dwelling. God is present in him or dwells in him. Of course, this is what we would expect from John's gospel. Since the word who was with God and was God became flesh and dwelt among us. The embodied image of God dwelling in the world is the fulfillment of the Isaianic promise concerning the virgin's son. She will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us, as we read in Matthew 1 and Isaiah 11. In fact, as Francis, Watkin, sorry, as Francis Watson has reflected, the persistent use of anthropomorphisms in reference to the actions of Yahweh throughout the Old Testament whether that be speaking, making, seeing, forming, walking, or more dramatically with Moses, Ezekiel and Isaiah, standing or sitting, and extraordinarily remembering, repenting, grieving or burning with rage, the consistency with which the invisible God depicts himself as being present and acting in human ways makes it all the more plausible that at such point that he determines to be seen, it would be in bodily form. For his part, Paul writes of, of the, to the Philippians of one who existing in the form of God, becoming in the likeness of humanity, or even to the church in Galatia, that Christ was born of a woman. That the image of God in human form might be anticipated throughout the Old Testament is less important, however, than the specific forms in which God determines to be present in the narrative, namely the tabernacle and then the temple. The possibility of God's personal presence in the man Jesus of Nazareth is developed in the Gospels through various allusions to the tabernacle in the Old Testament and the ongoing relationship between Jesus and the temple throughout. So in the prologue of John, we read that the Logos, who is God, dwelt among us, John 1.14. And in Gabriel's announcement to Mary, the virgin is told that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and power from the Most High will overshadow you. That's Luke 1.35. Now in John's case, the apostle described the incarnation using the language reminiscent of the depiction of the tabernacle in Exodus 25 the place in which Yahweh would dwell with his people. Furthermore, the overshadowing language in Luke's account is similar to the language used to describe the personal glory of Yahweh settling on the tabernacle in Exodus 40.35. Now, all these allusions are made concrete when Jesus himself makes an explicit association between his body and the temple. In John chapter 2, we read, Jesus says, <clears throat> destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it. The Jews replied, it took 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days? But he was referring to the temple of his body. The key thing to acknowledge here is the biblical authors prepare us to understand the presence of God in human form. God is present in the flesh of Jesus of Nazareth as his name was present both in the tabernacle and the temple. Both of those creaturely artifacts were sanctified by his presence. No sinner could be present in the cloud. It is holy. Yet neither of these artifacts ceased to be creaturely even when the divine presence entered into them. It is fully God and fully human that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God, fully creaturely at least. The possibility of the divine presence in the person of Jesus is due to the agency of the Spirit. Now we've just considered the two perspectives, Luke and John, of the incarnation. At one level, we may say that the flesh that the Word takes on is a work of the Spirit. Yet at another level, we might also say that it is the spirit that brings the Logos to be present in the royal son. The Lord himself will define his word ministry in terms of the spirit's agency in Luke 4, quoting Isaiah 61. In fact, in John's account, which is replete with instances of Jesus referring to his coming from above, he not only qualifies his arrival with the terminology of being sent by the Father, he again identifies his word ministry in terms of the agency of the Spirit. 
the spirit which the Father gives him without measure. That's John 3.34. Beyond this, the spirit who locates the word in Jesus in the line of David is the same spirit who speaks the word of the Lord through the prophets who anticipate his coming. It is the spirit of the Lord that identifies that a prophet speaks the word of the Lord amidst the varying groups of false prophets. It is the spirit of the Lord that speaks the word that comes from his mouth that will, will, not, will not return to him empty, but will accomplish what he pleases and will prosper in what he sends it to do. Now that's a quote from Isaiah 55.11 that many commentators take to be the paradigm for the word theology of John's gospel. Finally, of course, and more in relation to the rule of Yahweh, it is the agency of the Spirit that designates and empowers the Lord's choice of human agent in the history of salvation. This becomes explicit as early as Moses and Joshua, then throughout the Judges period, and most importantly, the king, first Saul, then David, are explicitly chosen by God and anointed with the Spirit. Even beyond into the exile, the Spirit of the Lord designates the servant as beloved in Isaiah 42 and empowers him for ministry in Isaiah 61, the identity that Jesus claims for his own. So far, so good, perhaps. Deep breath, zoom, stretch. <coughs> we have a strong sense in which through Jesus, sorry, which in the we have a strong sense in which through the Messiah and in the Spirit, the world is given a share in the reality of God, his presence and his rule. Of course, while the he to whom Paul refers in this passage is the beloved son, the eschatological Messiah of Psalm 110, he must be more than this simply because of what Paul also ascribes in terms of the world, everything was created by him. He is able to be the Lord present in creation and mediate divine rule over creation because he is the Lord who created the heavens and the earth. While Adam and David were mediators of God to the world, the activity of verse 16 can only be defined as divine since it requires him to be prior to creation. However, the messianic son was the crucified Jesus of Nazareth. This is the most debased experience to which human being could be subjected, cursed by God, in fact. In fact, in the, even in the lesser experience of deprivation, repudiation and alienation to which the son of David was subjected, those things can't be reconciled with the presence of the one true unoriginate creator of heaven and earth. After all, God alone is self-subsistent, agenitos, he is immaterial and thus without any kind of plurality or composition. He is subject to no natural processes, no emanation or diffusion of his substance. He is entirely free, rational and purposive. At least that was the conviction of one Arius of Alexandria, a deacon in the recently and imperially established Church of Constantinople in the early 4th century. In terms of what we're pursuing this morning, Arius was especially concerned about the dangers of claiming to have a share in the reality of God in Christ Jesus. Now, at this point, it's time for us to take a break. So in five minutes' time, we're going to come back here and I'll go on and we'll enter the realms of the Nicene debates. But for the next five minutes, I want you to look away from the screen, stand up and have a quick break and we'll come back and I'll start again. So welcome back. <laughs> We're about to enter into the Nicene debates. According to historical sources, Eris's local bishop, one Alexander of Alexandria, has been preaching on the mystery of the unity of the Holy Trinity. The bishop's theology gave particular prominence to his predecessor Origen's concept of eternal generation of the Son from the Father as the key to this unity. Now, the idea that the Son is eternally begotten of the Father is grounded in the first instance 
in the description of the Logos as monogenes in or only begotten of God in John 1.18. Your English translations will variously try and uh, capture that concept. Instead, argues Arius, considering what everyone knows about the true nature of the unoriginate and unbegotten God, Father, Son and Spirit are unified in the will of God. I'll repeat uh, Arius's claim. By the will of God, the Son is stably and unalterably what he is, a perfect creature, not just one among others. He is the inheritor of all the gifts and glories God can give him. But since this is the effect of God's sovereign will, the Father's glory and dignity is in no way lessened by such a gift. So the father wills the son or wills the existence of the son (coughs) and like any firstborn in the ancient Near East, the son receives all the blessings of his father but naturally remains separate to the father. It is a view of Yahweh of Israel that makes Jerusalem more admissible to Athens. Arius affirms the three, father, son and spirit, as God but gives absolute priority to the father. He's really God. The three are distinctly the objects of Christian confession, of course, as opposed to three entities of a general collection of reality as we know it. Nevertheless, God relates to his creation primarily through his will. (coughs) As Catholic scholar Khaled Anatolius notes, the divine act to will a mediator for creation is the main distinction between Arius' theology and that of Plato. In Arius' view, highlighting the active will of God towards the world avoids any sense in which the world is the product of divine emanations flowing out of God and into the world, that the world is really a version of God. Arius wants to keep God's being absolutely distinct from the being of his creation. No possibilities of pantheism here. And thus far, in fact, on that point, we possibly could agree with Arius. Arius's confidence for his position, however, rests on passages from Scripture like the one I put on the screen and your handout. (coughs) The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God And the Bible also tells us that God created wisdom prior to the rest of the world. In fact, the world was made through the wisdom of God. So Arius wrote to his bishop Alexander, and I'm quoting again, He, the Son, is a creature, but not as one of the creatures, a work, but not as one of the works, an offspring, but not as one of the offspring. This is the sense in which the son could be firstborn, as Paul describes it, but not a creature. Also, again quoting Arius, they say concerning him that God willing to create originate nature, when he saw that it could not endure the untempered hand of the father, and to be created by him, makes and creates first and alone one only, and calls him son and word, that through him as a medium, all things might thereupon be brought to be. So great (coughs) and vast is the distinction between the divinity and creatureliness that God wills there to be a mediator for creation between his ineffable divinity and the material world, the Son. At this point, we bring Athanasius to the conversation to help us understand the relationship between the Father and the Son from a protological perspective. I think Athanasius deserves a Usain Bolt stretch. That is, we need to understand the Lordship of Jesus from the generative nature of the Father rather than the volitional character of the divine nature. So in Discourse 3 of Contra Arianus, Athanasius pursues the how of the Son coming forth from the Father. He's addressing the Arian's assertion that the Son must come forth at the Father's will and pleasure, as one might glean from reading Ephesians 1, 5 and 9. To begin, Athanasius contends that there's nowhere in Scripture that is associating the act of willing or creating by God with the Son as a result. 
There's simply no scriptural warrant for what the Arians want to say. Athanasius goes on, however, to add that if the Son were to be willed, or a product of God's will, then there would need to be another word or wisdom. For Athanasius writes, and I'm quoting, God's will is not in the things which he brings into being, but in him through whom and in whom all things are made are brought to be. Athanasius is reading Colossians 1.16 here to show that the Father's will is mediated through the Son for creation, not for the Son to creation. Furthermore, to consider the word as somehow a product of divine will, again I quote, is to place times before the Son, for counselling goes before things which once were not, as in the case of all creatures. But if the word is the framer of the creatures, and he coexists with the Father, how can to counsel proceed the everlasting as if he were not? Or if he counsel, if counsel proceeds, how through him are all things? Or rather, he too, as one among others, is by will begotten to be a son, as we too were made sons by the word of truth. And it rests, as was said, to seek another word through whom he too has to come and was begotten together with all things. <coughs> What Athanasius is saying here is that if you make the Son a product of the Father's will, then the Father will have to deliberate according to a different wisdom in order to create the Son. More importantly, you are introducing some kind of temporal sequence into the life of God. Ultimately, you are confusing what it means to be made for the Word to be generated from the Father as opposed to being created by the Father. The word is the former, we creatures are the latter. Now in Colossians 1, Paul states that the Son is the image and firstborn of the Father because by him all things were created. That's verse 16. According to Athanasius, this must prove that the Son was before all things, as Paul echoes in verse 17. The Son cannot be the first creature as the Arians contend. Rather, as we read in, his, in Expositio Fidei, now he says, not was created be all, before all things, but is before all things. To be created, namely, is applicable to all things, but is before all applies only to the Son. Now, it's not hard to agree with Athanasius, who writes elsewhere, for the Son, as the Word, was in the beginning. Such there could not be a time before he was begotten, as the Arian assert. How can they say that the word son is a creature of the father when the apostles knew him to be the one in whom all things created have come into being and subsist? In addition, not even the pagans will presume to call one whom he confesses to be God a created thing or to say that he was not before when he was made. Now you see what Athanasius is getting at here? The writers of the scriptures themselves understood the Son to be equal and the same in nature with the Father because he already existed with the Father before he undertook any creative activity. Nicene theology requires us to attend to what the apostles themselves thought they were articulating of God's being as it's revealed through his acts. Any tradition, no matter how venerable, will have to be amended according to that. Even the pagans can see that, says Athanasius. Now, modern commentators of Colossians propose a wisdom background for the ideas on display in uh, Colossians chapter 1, and the fathers of the 4th century would have certainly agreed. As I've indicated, understanding the reference to birth of wisdom in Proverbs 8 was critical to the whole debate about what it meant to be firstborn. Athanasius's attitude to the Proverbs passage reveals much about his approach to theological interpreting of Scripture. Firstly, for example, in uh, Contra Arianus Discourse 2, he encourages his readers to remember that the Proverbs ought to be read as aphorisms, not literally, but figuratively. Even Christ Jesus used such language when necessary, and Athanasius gives the example of John 16.25. Secondly, the key term, he created me, in Proverbs 8, means nothing contrary to he begat, as in the monogenes of John 1.18. Not created me that I might have been, says Athanasius, 
nor because I have a creature's beginning and origin. More importantly, but less intuitively perhaps for us, Athanasius understood these verses to anticipate the incarnation. For in this passage, writes Athanasius, not as signifying the essence of his Godhead, nor his own everlasting and genuine generation from the Father, has the words spoken by Solomon, but on the other hand, his manhood and economy towards us. To the extent that Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God in 1 Corinthians, that then Proverbs 8 is describing the plan of God before the world to send his Son in our likeness. Of course, Athanasius has a great deal more to say on the matter, addressing each and every one of the possible permutations of Arius' readings of Proverbs 8. Nevertheless, all his responses turn between the necessity of understanding the Son as eternally generated from the Father or the wisdom of God becoming the man Jesus of Nazareth. For Athanasius, this movement in God of eternal generation and the coming of the word wisdom of God into creation come together as we reflect on what it means for the world to be made through the word or son. Paul writes that the son is the image and the firstborn because the world was made through him. The language is repeated in 1 Corinthians 8 and echoed in the opening verses of John's Gospel. It's basic to the Old Testament view of creation as evidenced on the screen in Psalm 33 verse 6, which was another key verse during the Nicene controversies. Since Arius and his followers had separated the creation of the Son from the creation of the world, Athanasius is keen to ensure that Paul's language and John's not be understood merely instrumentally. The creation of the world isn't subcontracted to the Son by the Father so as to keep his being separated from creatures who are otherwise too weak to countenance his presence. Rather, since the Son is of the essence of the Father, as light enlivens all things by its radiance, the Father, by, as by a hand in the word, wrought all things without him make nothing is made. That's contrary Arianus again. Rather than being a product of the Father's will for creating, the Son or word is the means through which the Father's will gains shape in, throughout, and for creation as a person's hand gives shape to her intentions. This metaphor was handed down to Athanasius by Irenaeus of Lyon and is designed to enhance the immediacy of relations between God and the world, says uh, Anatolius. <clears throat> now, should the analogy of the Son as God's hand in any way detract from the communion of essence that Father and Son enjoy, in his work against the Gentiles, Athanasius appeals to Genesis 1 to highlight the absolute intimacy between the Father and the Son as a reflexive deliberation of an agent in his actions. Let me quote to you. Who then could it be save his word, speaking of Genesis 1, for to whom could God be said to speak except his word, let us make? Or who was with him when he made or created existence except his wisdom? That's Contra Gentiles, uh, part 46. This is an internal reciprocal dynamic on view between the Father and his wisdom in the act of creating and governing the creation, yet on the understanding that the Father's deity passes into the Son without flow and without division. Of course, in the contest with Arius over the Son as the will of God, Athanasius maintains that the Son proceeds from the Father's nature as only begotten, an activity that precedes and supersedes any act of volition. The eternal generation of the Son from the Father precedes counselling, says Athanasius, and is thus by nature. And Athanasius gives the example of the difference between a man building a house and begetting a son. Basically, a man builds a, a house is the product of a man's will, whereas the son comes from the father's nature. The analogy has some weaknesses, particularly for us uh, in the uh, era of contraception, but the principle still holds. There's a necessary separation between God, what God creates according to his will, but there is no separation between the Father and the Son who comes forth from his divine nature. Thus, the Son is the complement of the Father's deliberation, or better, the one with whom the Father might be said to deliberate. Athanasius concludes, This is what the Son says of himself in the Proverbs. Gospel is mine and security, mine is understanding and mine strength. That's Proverbs 8, uh, 
So while he says mine is counsel, he must himself be the living counsel of the Father, as we've learned from the prophets also, that he becomes an angel of great counsel, quoting Isaiah 5. That was called <coughs> and was the good pleasure of the Father. These are human illustrations concerning God, says Athanasius, and notes Shaft, we ought to understand the Father's will, command, and the Son's fulfilment, his ascent, as one act. Yet even so, as Athanasius said about the apostles, these are the words of the word through the prophets and therefore a self-description. This is the way that God is speaking about himself. Okay, deep breath, zoom stretch. There is one aspect of Paul's description of the image and firstborn that prompts us to go beyond the Nicene theology of Athanasius at least that is to the extent to which the purpose of creation, of the economy, reveals something of the Father's will for himself in Christ Jesus. Broadly speaking, the focus in the Arian controversy that was so fundamental to the establishment of Nicene theology was on the Father's act of creation and the subsequent incarnation of the Son for salvation. The focus of the dispute was more on the protological issues as distinct from eschatological ones. In fact, as Scharf notes, it is the necessary, it is the general teaching of the fathers that our Lord would not have been incarnate had no man sinned. That is not the teaching of Irenaeus, however, and need not be inconsistent with Athanasius, what he had to say about the will of God in relation to his good pleasure. We do first need to consider the kind of answer that Athanasius might have given to the question of why God created the world in the first place. <coughs> in Against the Arians, uh, Discourse 2, Part 15, Athanasius implies that the existence of creation itself stems from the fruitfulness of the divine essence itself. If we were to ask, as Leibniz would later, why is there something when there should be nothing? A possible answer from Athanasius would be due to the same fruitfulness from which the Father generates his word. Of course, the word is proper to the Father's essence, whereas the creation is out of nothing. Nevertheless, it's proper to the Father's essence to generate. And this is true not only of his word, but of creation itself. I'm quoting Athanasius here. For if the divine essence be not fruitful itself, but barren, as they hold, as light that lightens not, and a dry fountain, are they not ashamed to speak of his possessing framing energy? But if he frames things that are external to him and before were not, by willing them to be, and becomes their maker, much more will he be the first father of an offspring from his proper essence. We know that the Son is begotten of the Father, from his essence as opposed to being the product of the Father's will. This is possible, according to Athanasius, because it is proper to the essence or nature of the Father to be generative of his word. The act of will and creation is the manner in which the Father, through the Son, directs that generative life for the world, albeit from nothing. This is the Father's form of divine grace. He initiates the generation of the Son, and through the Son, he creates the world. Yet what we have here in this last clause of Colossians 1.16, associated with the act of creating, is the purpose of that act and, in fact, the end goal of the economy of salvation, the goal revealed in the resurrection of Messiah Jesus in the power of the Spirit. All things were created for the image and firstborn, the beloved Son. <coughs> Paul uses similar language to that, which we find here in Colossians 1 in Romans 9, the focus there being the Father. Yet here in Colossians, as we have seen, the beloved Son is the point of reference in relation to creation. The two ought not to be put against one another, since, as Athanasius was at pains to point out, whatever the Father does in the economy of salvation, he does through his Son. Nevertheless, the will of the Father for creation is given a terminus, and that is none other than the person of the Messianic Son, the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> now, Paul expands upon this for us in Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. There we are told that before the foundation of the world, the Father willed according to his good pleasure to sum up creation in Christ. <clears throat> 
The glorified Messiah of Psalm 110 is the goal of the Father's will for creation. But in so revealing this mystery, we have also been given insight into the will of God for himself in relation to creation. He wills to be the Father of Jesus the Christ, who is the Lord. Now, the reference in Ephesians to the Father's will throughout the Son, according to his good pleasure, is quite significant for us at this point. On the whole, Athanasius claims that such references, especially in the context of relations between father and son, show that the son is not a work, but in essence, indeed, the father's offspring. While in the economy, according to the good pleasure of the father, he was on our behalf made and consists as man. The father's actions in the economy of salvation, including the word becoming flesh, are according to his good pleasure. Phrases like this imply that God de deliberates on how he might do things the way that is subsequently self-pleasing. What is more, such acts are what ensures that there is no necessity placed on God and he is therefore free from any inner con compulsion or outer constraint. However, if the Son comes from the Father according to nature, then good pleasure from the Father to the Son could be meaningless since the Son comes from the Father effectively by some kind of inner compulsion. Athanasius again appeals to the significance of generation from and by nature. Let me read. The Son is with the pleasure of the Father, and he, as he says of himself, the Father loves the Son and shows him all things. For not from will did the Father begin to be good, nor yet as good without will and pleasure. For what he is, that also is his pleasure." So also that the Son should be thought of come not from will, yet not without his pleasure or against his purpose. Since the Son is of the essence of the Father, the Son is generated from the Father's essence according to the Father's pleasure in self-determination. He can no more choose to generate the Son than he can choose to be good. At the same time, since God is absolutely self-determining as the Father of the Son, not constrained to be so, so also the son of the, is the son of the father according to his pleasure. For as his own subsistence is he by his pleasure, so also the son, being proper to his essence, not without his pleasure. Be then the son the object of the father's pleasure and love, and thus let everyone religiously account of the pleasure and the not unwillingness of God. For by that good pleasure wherewith the Son is the object of the Father's pleasure, is the Father the object of the Son's love, pleasure, and honour. And the one is the good pleasure from which Father in Son, so here too we may contemplate the Son in the Father and the Father in the Son. Now what Athanasius is saying here is that God as Father eternally generates the Son with pleasure. This is the Father's love for the Son. In the same way that God does not decide to be good, nor is he constrained to be so by some external force, he does not decide to be the father of the Son, nor is he constrained to be so. The divine form of grace proper to the Father is initiative towards the Son, his pleasure and love for the Son. The Father loves the Son and the Son loves and honours the Father. The divine form of grace proper to the Son is response to the Father's initiative. Not by constraint or in a compulsion, but according to the pleasure with which God is absolutely self-determining and self-authenticating. With Athanasius, with Athanasius's pleasure principle in mind, we can offer something more of the being and act of God as revealed in the economy of salvation. When we consider other key passages like Philippians 2, 6 to 8, the attitude of Christ Jesus towards the Father is the pleasure of the Son with the Father, not by will but according to his pleasure in the Father. This is the imminent reality of divine life that is expressed in the incarnation as self-emptying and self-humbling. Instead of somehow eschewing his divinity, he is rather expressing his love, pleasure and honour of the Father. This is the Son's form of divine grace, his response to the Father. It is out of his pleasure in the Father that the Son becomes incarnate. He is located by the Spirit of the line of David, as we've seen. What is more, it is out of his love for the Father that he mediates the rule of the Father to the world in word and deed as the Spirit enables. Out of his love for the Father, he humbles himself and suffers the contingencies of creatureliness in his flesh, all the while empowered by the Father's Spirit 
to perform the works of God. Ultimately, as Paul outlines in Philippians 2, he expresses his pleasure towards the Father in submitting himself to death on a cross. For as he tells the disciples himself in John 14, 31, so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do as the Father commanded me. It is worth pausing at this point just to point out that John 14, 31 is the only verse in the New Testament that states explicitly a love of the Son for the Father. Yet considering what we've learned from Athanasius about the Son's pleasure in the Father, it makes perfect sense. The pleasure of the Son for the Father is fulfilled even after the completion of the economy of salvation. For the pleasure of the Lord Jesus Christ is to offer all creation up to the Father for his glory. The end that Paul describes here is the general resurrection at the dawning of the new creation. Yet it is also marks the economic resolution of the eternal relations between father and son with a new creation everlastingly acting as the theatre of the father's glory in exaltation of the son. According to Psalm 110, it is this point that the enemies of the son will be made the footstool and so the judgment of God, the exaltation of the son and the glory of the father will be vindicated as Jesus, the image and firstborn, Lord and Messiah, is acclaimed everlastingly. There is wrath for those that reject the Son and mercy for those who trusted his promises. What's more, as the everlasting high priest in the order of Melchizedek, the Messiah will lead all creation in worship of the Father everlastingly, according to his eternal pleasure in the Father. Since it is the Son's form of grace to respond to the Father's sending or initiative, his own form of divine grace, I suggest that we view the completion of the economy of salvation as the interchange of love that the Father and Son have for one another. Our share in the reality of God is held together for us in the exaltation of Christ Jesus as the Lord to the glory of God the Father. In this view of the economy of salvation, God reveals something of his life before there was a world, the Father and the Son eternally in each other's pleasure. Yet the Father's pleasure for the Son is revealed in his choice of Jesus as the Christ, which means the history of the world is significant for establishing this identity for the Son of God, since all things are created for him. In fact, the history of the world is the means by which the Father exalts the crucified Christ Jesus as the Lord. We can now, albeit briefly I fear, make some response to the choosing self's theology in the form of Hegel's pantheism. Hegel had been attempting to philosophically articulate the concept of God to avoid both the pitfalls of pietism and the Enlightenment. And at the risk of grossly oversimplifying an otherwise largely abstract and inaccessible system, we may say that Hegel understood the life of God in himself or relations of origin as follows, and I quote, The first movement of absolute spirit is one in which spirit negates itself in producing its own other. This can be equated with the traditional analogy of the father begetting the son, who is nevertheless of the same essence of the father, since as the negation of spirit, the spirit's other is still spirit. Since spirit consists in unity amidst distinction, spirit overcomes this negation and differentiation, not by extinction of difference, but rather through reconciliation that produces unity in differentiation. In the Western tradition, this second movement comes in the analogy of the spirit proceeding from the father and the son as the bond of love that unites them. And that's a, uh, a simplification from Powell uh, trying to capture the essence of Hegel's theology. The key issue here is just how synonymous with the tradition Hegel's modern variation really is. Even if Hegel's language of negation and reconciliation in the context of father and son and spirit is not as meant to sound as drastic as it does, it's difficult to see how the, use, the unity of Usia that subsists in the three hypostases is maintained. It certainly sounds like some kind of separation that has to be repaired. Of course, Hegel's philosophical system is meant to describe the absolute as all being or existence in itself, God and the world, or the world in God. From this perspective, the world itself is the other that is the negation from the absolute to be overcome at the reconciliation of all things. Absolute spirit thereby achieves absolute knowledge of itself in the movement. 
the absolute spirit absorbs all things back to itself. The same principle is meant to govern the manner in which two seemingly opposing contradictory positions of thought are found in the history of the world. Now, it's at this point that we can stop and ask whether or not there's a false premise in the thinking of Hegel and in Arius himself, namely that God's being is somehow opposed to the world and that the world's creation is somehow alien to the life of the God who created it. If we understand the reality of the world eschatologically, that is not simply from the beginning or even merely through salvation, but from the perspective of the Father's pleasure for the Son, then we have a very different view of the reality of the world. Since the Father creates all things through him and for him, as Paul tells us, we must assume that the world is, that creatureliness, is the kind of being that is fit for the Father to express his pleasure in the Son. It is a creation that has been made and will be perfected towards the Son's pleasure in glorifying the Father. The Father's choice of Jesus as the Christ in the history of the world is for the purpose of exalting him as the Lord who made the heavens and the earth everlastingly. There is nothing inherently adverse about the world to be the being of God, seen if only in the fact that it is exalted, beloved Son, the everlasting ruler in God's kingdom of light, who leads all creation in worship the Father as the Lord. The everlasting reign of the Messiah has little or no place in Hegel's system with the resolution of absolute spirit. Basically, the glorified Jesus just disappears. Even less is there a place for him in the theology of Arius. So this morning I've pursued a portrait of the share in the reality of God and the world that comes to us at the same time in Christ Jesus the Lord, since he is before all things and in him all things hold together. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, in whom and through whom we receive our share in the reality of God. Yet as I've said, I'm seeking an answer to the question this week, what happens when God's choice of Jesus confronts the choosing self? This morning I hope I've given a much larger picture of the God and Father of our Lord Jesus who confronts the choosing self with a world that he created through and for the exaltation of his Son as the Lord. At least we've seen that the world is the choice of the Father to express his pleasure for the Son. The world which is his divine form of grace is in the world in which his divine form of grace is initiative for the Son. At the same time, we've seen that the Son's response, his pleasure in the Father, the love from which he glorifies the Father, is his form of divine grace. Finally, I've suggested that both Arius and Hegel, as the representatives of the choosing self's theology, have begun with a false premise. That the world is inherently somehow against, alien or otherwise averse to the life of God. Instead, I've posited that the world is the kind of being, the kind of existence that the Father created from nothing for the purpose of exalting his Christ, Jesus the Lord. This is the world in which the Lord Jesus confronts the choosing self. Now, most of you should be thinking, aren't there forces of sin, death and evil in the world over which Christ is victorious, at least according to the gospel? This will be the focus in the next lecture, when the choice of God for Jesus the Lord as Christ confronts the choosing self from a theological point of view, that reaction of the choosing self is envy, an envy that leads to the death of the Son. This will be the topic of tomorrow's lecture as we explore the fact that even in his death at the hands of his own creatures, in God's choice of Jesus, all things hold together. I'm sure you uh, will echo, wherever you are, your um, sincere um, appreciation for that rich and stimulating lecture, as I found uh, just now. Uh, we have an opportunity for some questions. Uh, if you would like to um, ask a question, um, please use the Slido app and the code that you have uh, uh, have been sent or the Slido website where you can uh, click uh, on that red uh, link uh, for your question. Uh, we already have quite a number of contenders, um, so I'll get stuck into it. Uh, 
The first question is from Martin. How similar or different is pleasure to glory with respect to the Father and the Son? Uh, thank you. How similar is glory to the pleasure? Well, I think uh, glory and exaltation are the terms in the economy that God has given us to understand this mutual pleasuring that the Father and the Son have in one another. So the glory of the Father is the pleasure of the Son and the exaltation of the Son is the pleasure of the Father. That's how they are expressed to us uh, in the economy of salvation. Dan asks, does Athanasius argue that the Son derives his deity and essence from the Father, his whatness, or just his personhood, his whoness? In the context, I think Athanasius needs to uh, look to the Father as the origin, the, the font of divinity. Uh, and so he doesn't really make the same kind of uh, distinction such that the essence of the Father is who the Father is. And so in that essence, from that essence, the Father uh, speaks forth his word, his Son, such that the Son is homoousius, uh, of the Father and with the Father. Uh, we have another question. David, are you proposing that will is proper to hypostases or do you see will belonging to ousia? I think the... Uh, expression here that uh, the Cappadocian uh, Athanasius uh, and consequently the uh, Cappadocian fathers use is that uh, the agency uh, of the Father through the Son and in the Spirit is the means by which the divine will is exercised. So there are, uh, as there are appropriations of Usia to Father, Son and Spirit without division, uh, the will of God from the Father, through the Son, and in the Spirit, is uh, variously uh, revealed uh, in the one action of uh, God in the world for creation. I think this is sort of a, a follow-up footnote question. Are we to understand then that the will of the Father is separate in any way from the will of the eternal Son? That was a large part of the uh, Nicene debate, that uh, the will of the Father might be somehow separate uh, to the Son. He wills a Son who then goes on and uh, wills creation for him. I guess what I'm trying to get at here is that uh, as the usia is appropriated to persons, Father, Son and Spirit, without division, in the same way we can refract the will of God from the Father through the Son and in the Spirit. And in the economy of salvation, that will looks differently, uh, distinctly, as the persons themselves do in the one act of uh, the Father through the Son and in the Spirit for salvation and exaltation and glorification. Uh, here's another question. Uh, David, given what you've said on the role of the Son in creation and the incarnation, uh, what can we say regarding a distinction between nature and supernature? Uh, I have to confess I'm not really sure what that question is asking by the, a distinction between nature and supernature. <laughs> 
Oh, okay. Uh, no, that doesn't really help at all. Uh, I'm sorry, I just, I haven't, that's caught me off guard. I really have no answer to that. I will look up uh, supernature and nature in Henri de Lubac and try and get back to you. <coughs> We might one more. Yeah. We, we might have time for one more, just to give David a break. Uh, these questions are, uh, you know, well and truly throwing him in the deep end. Um, let me just find one last question to ask. Um, Romans eight sixteen says that for Christians, the divine spirit lives in us alongside our spirit. Is the same true for Jesus, or is Jesus vivified by a singular spirit? The actions of the spirit in creating the flesh uh, in which the son inhabits uh, involve creating a human being in which the eternal son dwells. So in the sense that uh, Jesus of Nazareth is animate as a human being like human beings are, he has that human sense of spirit. <clears throat> However, like uh, in the same way that the uh, name of God dwells in the tabernacle or, or the temple, the spirit of God makes the word of God present in Jesus of Nazareth without uh, compromising uh, his humanity and yet, uh, at the same time, God is present with him. So from that point of view, uh, God's spirit in Christ uh, is there because uh, God is there, uh, which is distinct from the way that God's spirit acts on us and our spirit to unite us to Christ. Thank you, David, and uh, thank you to you all very much for joining us this morning. Uh, I'm sure you'll allow me to express uh, our sincere appreciation on behalf of us all for David's very stimulating lecture this morning, wonderful treat, and we look forward to the next instalment tomorrow. Uh, the lectures continue this week. Uh, from Tuesday to Friday. Each will begin at 9 a.m. So until tomorrow morning, 9 a.m., we'll see you then.